Next one, buying your first system. <laughs> okay, this might be tough because... Well, I, we've I, already I, talked about half of that in the previous <coughs> in the video. But also, I, I, I these days rarely talk to somebody buying their first system. So it's been a long time. Well, I talk to more people about that than you do. But yeah. um, so back in the day, I was taught a certain formula. Yeah for figuring out your budget for a wait, system. Wait, let, let's introduce this formally. Oh, okay. As usual. Hi everyone, Adrian from Audio Excellence Canada, Philip over there, and Jerry just snuck out for a smoke and a drink. Shame on him. Anyway, uh, today we're going to cover if you're buying your first system, what should you be looking for? What are the different, stra uh, what's the strategy and tactics that you might consider employing? So as I was saying earlier, um, it's been a long time since I was asked this question. Um, part of it is that I don't uh, uh, get to talk to um, many of the clients who come by or, or email us uh, on a regular basis. Philip tends to do much more than, and so does Jerry. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what Philip uh, uh, thinks. Take it away, Philip. If somebody came to you and said, "I have headphones," <laughs> right? Like like the gentleman who came in the other day uh, 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 talking to us about a job. I've got headphones. Or Jerry, you know, and now he's thinking about an audio system. What would you suggest? How do you go about doing this? Oh, wow. I mean, I mentioned in the previous video um, the story of m my first system, um, which was, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. It was, it was a NAD3020 pair of Boston Acoustic A70s and a dual 506 with uh, Orifon, basically it was like a OM20 on it. They called it something else, but it's the equivalent, a 20E or something like that. And just a quick story, when you said that this, oh my God, there's such a clear vis visual memory. So I was buying a, my first turntable back then. Yeah. It was also a dual. I can't remember which model it was. And at the time, Dual was marketing this idea that was called the ultra lightweight tone. That's right. Right. ULM. That's or right. Something like that. With like an OM10 or whatever the ultra equivalent low mass. Is. Right. And and I was trying to ex understand why this was important. And so the salesperson was saying the reason that you want this is because one, it can track really well uh, uh, when you have a warped uh, record. And also, number two, because of the ultra lightweight mass, you won't damage the grooves. Because back then, the only two sources really that you had were cassettes and records. So that seemed to make a lot of sense to my stupid, you know, what I thought was so smart brain back then going to engineering. So, and then what he did was he took a dollar bill back when there actually was a dollar bill and he folded it. So it was sort of like, you know, and then he put it under the record. Right, so now you you have this record that that looks right. like it's a warp, and then he played the thing, and sure enough, it played, it tracked, and I was sold right there. It's like a dual five hundred five or five fifteen, I was sold. That was like cool. So anyway, when you said uh, uh, the, the well, little did I realize that of course the bearing quality and the 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 tolerances in that tone arm were just terrible. Like you could <laughs> you could literally shake it all about it. It just wouldn't sit. There was no tightness to it. Um, that, <laughs> I still remember what I paid for it. It was 200 bucks, which was... For what? The whole system? No, for the turntable. Oh, the turntable. The I paid turntable more. was $200 and the amp was $300 and the speakers were around 400 bucks. And I was trying to follow this formula. I was told that you apply half of your budget to a speaker, uh one third to the amplifier and one sixth to the to the turntable uh, i didn't quite Whatever get there was left over yeah 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 so uh but i had no idea but i started at a at some point and it, it of course cascaded into many 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 other purchases um, but i was very happy with that system for you know the two or three years that i had it until 
I heard other stuff that was better. <laughs> um, but you got to start somewhere. And again, the, the other video I mentioned that I read as much as possible. And so I just took the plunge. I took, I, that's exactly what I did. I took a plunge and I started to gain experience. And undoubtedly what will happen with your first system is that um, at some level you'll really, really like it. And then whether or not you grow beyond that level is another story. But I have many friends who still own the first system they ever purchased when they were in university. I have many friends that can't even keep something in their system for a week. We know lots of people like that. Uh, and then there's everybody, you know, there's everything in between. So when you're buying your first system, obviously the most, I think the most important thing is budget. You definitely want to stay within your budget and, um, you know, don't be too concerned about get, getting like some super duper whatever. You got to start somewhere. It has to make you happy. It has to put a smile on your face and it can be very basic. Very basic is actually very good. Less complicated is very good because there are fewer factors that you have to figure out. So, okay. So let let uh, as in the pre the previous video we just did, let's start at the ten thousand foot level. The strategy. So you identify the budget. Good. Have a little bit of flexibility there, just in case you hear something you like and so on. So that's a that's a good thing. And then I I, I made a list of things that I would probably uh, do if I was doing this all over again. You know, I would list my musical priorities. Now, this might be difficult because we're, we're talking from hindsight. So over the years, we know what we like. But if this is your first system, you may not know what you like. This may be difficult. So um, try to get to listen to two or three systems, either visit stores or friends and see what you're listening to and see if you like that. Um, and then identify what it is that you like about what you're listening to. My, again, might be difficult. Maybe the the first thing to do is see if you can find an audio mentor. I don't know mm -hmm. because you know the, the well, audio. That's not a silly I'm, idea right, because yeah. we have many friends. That's how they started, right. and I've 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 heard all the stories. And in fact, obviously, I had several mentors, and um, you know that's that's how it yeah. kind of went. Yeah, because you know it may be difficult to understand what it is that you're listening to and try and put words into all of that. So that's not necessarily a bad idea. So these days with online, you might be able to find somebody in around the neighborhood that you live and say, look, you know, can I come over, listen to what you've got, and then you can teach me about this. So that might be a good uh, start as well. And then the other thing is, um, uh, I wrote down here, decide if you're okay with new or used. Um, and we've, we've done one or two videos on buying used and um, in many ways that's a wonderful way to, to, to do things but you've got to be very careful in this video we won't go into that but certainly that's an option uh, you, with used equipment um, Will have any thoughts about Again it's the idea of taking a risk taking a plunge trying stuff out uh, don't be too married to the notion that you must you, know, you must make the perfect choice. There is no perfect choice. But the more you experience, the more different things you have in, in your system and you're able to listen to for a prolonged period, it's going to tell you, first of all, what you really like. So you might think, oh, I need to have this, this, and that. But really what you like is the other stuff that becomes more important. Like I never thought it would be important to have, you know, a toe tapping capability or dynamics in your system, but we learned that dynamics is really important. And certainly for some gear like a uh, name, that's always been a, a big selling point of theirs is that you can always, you know, groove to it because it's got a great sense of um, movement in, in, in the way it pre presents the, uh, the music. Um, so... <coughs> Yeah, so um, so I listed a bunch of other things that, that we'll discuss. Um, it says here, read reviews and opinions, but be aware that opinions do not necessarily mean that they are yours. Thanks. So, you know, uh, back in the early days of uh, the Internet, um, I remember being fascinated by the fact that you could find forums and websites and people talking about audio, and I would, I would read, and you know, on occasion I would join the forum and, and be a part of it. And... People were really generous with their time and opinions. And of course, every so often it would devolve. And, you know, the <laughs> thread would just go nuts and it would just be terrible. But a lot of very interesting 
conversations and experiences from people who had been doing this a very long time. But what I also noticed was that newbies would invariably say, I'm now conf- I'm more confused than ever because there are 15 or 20 people posting and everyone has slightly different opinions. And what's he supposed to think or take away from? Um, so it comes back to probably this point. And unfortunately, the point is going to sound very self-serving. It's not meant to. Find yourself a good dealer. uh, If you're lucky, you might have three or four really good dealers in your neighborhood, in your area. Uh, But if not, try to find one that's relatively close um, and and work closely with that person. Uh, Both Philip and I were very fortunate to find Ring Audio way back when and then over the years, you know, find others that could help us. And then eventually we were able to do it ourselves. Um, But a really good dealer is... uh, a wonderful lesson. So I'm a very big advocate about not having too many voices in your head. So in other words, maybe they're all valid um, observations and experiences and, you know, but at the same time, it becomes, as you said, very confusing. How do you choose? When we say that everything is correct, we, we actually literally mean that to a certain extent. And so there's validity in most of what is said, but at the same time, you need to narrow your focus. And the only way to do that is by obviously, you know, trusting only a few voices. Even to this day, there are only certain there are only certain reviewers that I definitely 100% trust. In, in, in but not, well, that's to say that um, most of them are so-called legitimate, you know, uh, uh, audio. Uh, uh, journalists uh, who have a track record of, you know, um, kind of presenting the truth in a way that's uh, definitely verifiable. Well, invariably, as far as reviews are concerned, you will probably find one or two that seem to like what you like and are able to communicate in such a way that you understand. And so you you gravitate towards that, right? Uh, And then there are other reviewers who are perhaps really good and can write really well but for some reason you read it and you say I don't get it I don't I don't hear what he hears and you know there are quite a few uh, for example Sterifile uh, when I used to buy the print uh, versions there would be all kinds of reviewers who I certainly thought they were doing their best to uh, uh, describe what they heard but never seemed to jive with me and then uh, you know once once in a while you'd find somebody and go okay this guy I get it. I understand what he's saying. And I may disagree with his findings, but I understand what he says. And I would actually read that reviewer more closely because of that. So reviewers certainly help. But I think if you can, find a good dealer. Now, finding a dealer is one thing. One of the um, things I've noticed over the years is that, especially if you are new to the store, there's an understandable sense of holding back you know what is the word i'm looking for you know you don't want to sort of say everything so you want to sort of well there's a reluctance there's a i mean you you know what i'm talking about i can't find the word but i think you you all understand what i'm saying it's like trying to buy a car you go to a car dealer and the guy you're not showing all your cards yeah you you go how can i help you today i'm just looking right that kind of thing well so here's the thing if i if i it's about trust really if i may if i may be so bold and make this suggestion have an initial conversation with the salesperson first, just sort of get to know that person. And then if you feel you can trust that person, be honest with that person. Because if you think you can trust that person, he can't help you if you are not um, as uh, clear about your intentions as you can be. It doesn't mean that you are locked in with that person. It doesn't mean you have to buy something at all. But you need to clarify what is it that you're trying to do and be as honest and and as forthcoming as possible. A good salesperson will be able to take that information and truly help you. It could could be literally as simple as saying, I can't help you. We don't sell anything like that. But I know a store. Or these are the things that I would buy if I were you and then give you a list of things to check out. You know, it could be as simple as that. Uh, It could also be, look, what you're asking, um, uh, I can do for you. But because it's going to be a big journey, let me prepare some stuff. We're going to need a couple, three hours. Can we book, you know, let's say next Thursday as an example. It might be something like that. Um, just understand also that uh, you will need to work with that person or a couple of people. 
So um, my suggestion, again, is be very honest with them and be upfront and say, this is also what I'm looking to do and this is also what my budget is. I'm just starting out. Now, the cool thing is this. I know for me and I know for Jerry and, and, and Philip, if we find out that this person is new and this is the first stereo system that they're looking, oh, we are crazy. We, we're so happy because it's like, oh, vampires, you know, fresh blood. No, we're so no, happy. no, no, there's not yeah, vampires. I, I, I get so excited when that happens because it means um, we've somehow been able to inculcate this uh, to somebody new. I don't know about other dealers. Uh, Philip? Uh, well, <laughs> you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> Bill will just go, Jerry, come over here. <laughs> I have no time for you. <laughs> I definitely get a bit of a rush when I meet someone that I can kind of indoctrinate. <laughs> uh, I mean, I did that to Jay yeah. to a certain degree. Um, and there have been other clients um, like, okay, so recently I had, I had someone drop into the, in, into the store and he had some hand-me-down equipment from his father, some relatively decent stuff, but it was all connected incorrectly. And he thought he was doing a really good job. And, and I looked at it and I couldn't understand exactly how, how come he hooked up this. Like he had two speakers. One was Totem Model 1. And then he was also had a pair of Klipsch's. And the way he had everything connected, it was con the speakers were connected in series. Mm -hmm. And he had a subwoofer in the system. And anyways, it wasn't working properly. And I said to him, well, it's way too complicated. This is connected incorrectly. You don't need to do it this way. And in fact, your Model 1s are really good speakers, and you're using a tube amp with this. Just connect the Model 1s to the tube amp. Forget about the clips because they're really different efficiencies. They don't work well together because he was using the Model 1s just to provide high frequencies. But because of the way it was connected, none of it would work correctly. And it took me two attempts to convince him otherwise. And he finally just rejigged everything and connected only the Model 1s. And then he had the subwoofer connected um, to, to his preamp. Um, and he said to me, Philip, it sounds much better. So that gave me a great sense of satisfaction because I was able to help that person. Now, I did not, um, I, you know, we, I didn't sell them anything, but I still felt a great deal of uh, comfort to know that um, um, I was able to help him. And um, he's much happier now. So, you know, win, win, win. Yeah, for sure. So all of that is to say, if you can, find yourself a, a one or two good dealers that you can work with and um, uh, be very uh, forthright with them so they can truly help you. And then the other thing I was thinking of was um, you've got to listen for more than a few minutes uh, at least to see if the system is what you like. You can't really tell if you like something if it's just the first impressions. Uh, in the earlier video we did today, we talked about how some speakers sound so impressive for the first two or three minutes. But if you were to listen longer, it might be um, very fatiguing. Um, if, if this is new to you, if you've never bought an audio system before, it's going to take uh, a bit of research and time uh, to understand all the different glossaries, all the what do these words mean. You know, when you say something is warm, well, we generally uh, know what we mean when we say warm, but to a, to a, to a, to a, a new uh, buyer, what does warm mean? You know, he's thinking blankets, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, um, it's not that far off. <laughs> you know, uh, um, what does bass mean? What, you know, and so a really good a dealer can play certain music and say, okay, well, this is bass. This is what we talk, mean when we talk about bass. And this is what mid-range means, and he plays certain things and high frequencies and so on. So it's going to take some time. Um, and I remember the first time somebody did that for me, uh, it was... Um, truly wonderful very eye-opening the gentleman um he was not busy and he could see i was really uh, thirsty for knowledge and so he took about 30 40 minutes and he played some cuts for me and took me through it and told me what magazines to read and what magazine it stopped reading stereo review and high fidelity and i was shocked he would say that because to me those were the audio bibles he said no 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 Try to see if you can find a magazine magazine called Ultra High Fidelity. 
Oh, that's a good magazine. What was, what was the early version of UHF? Was it always called UHF? Oh, I don't remember that far back. I, because I didn't find out about that magazine until the 90s. Yeah, so so this is a magazine that's published in Quebec, in, in Canada. I'm trying to remember if it was under a different name before. But I, I discovered this magazine because this gentleman, in a shopping mall of all places, told me, you need to find magazines like this, and it will open up your world. And, and so I eventually did find a copy of that magazine. It was a very big, tall magazine, like one of those fashion glamour magazines. And I was blown away by what they were writing. And I thought half of it was nonsense because they didn't do any measurements. And people actually said they could hear differences between amplifiers. And Julian Hurst says, basically, if it measures well, it should all sound pretty good. Um, but it opened my eyes to, to a whole new world. So um, that can really help as well. Um, any other thoughts as to... Oh, uh, I put down here, um, think about resale value. I'm not sure why I said that, but... Well, that's an important um, yeah. consideration for the equipment that we bring into the store. Uh, at some point, you are going to want to resell it because you want to try something different unless you just don't ever resell, like sell any of your stuff that you buy. There are We, we know some people like that and they live alone. <laughs> Well, that means usually they'll resell. They'll have lots and lots of stuff. No, it means that they have a four-bedroom house and every room is filled with stuff. <laughs> uh, that was my life at one point. Yeah, um, yeah so the resale value, know this. You're, you're going to lose money. That's It doesn't really matter what the, the equipment is outside of a few things. Very few audio gear actually appreciates. See, about the, one of the few things I can think of is obviously Macintosh. Vintage Macintosh sells for more now than it did then, but it's taken 30 years, 40 years to get to that point. Um, so you want to try and mitigate some of the um, losses that you might incur, especially if you buy new equipment. Even if you buy used stuff, you won't always get the same value back out of it. It, it tends to depreciate a little bit. And that's not just for audio gears, for lots of things. So, I mean, because I used to buy keyboards, keyboards were the same thing even though you know uh you get them at a reasonable price but at some point you're going to want to resell and it's going to be less one it's of my just... favorite keyboards of all time was the korg m1 oh yeah that's a very nice i keyboard. love that keyboard was was a, a little bit complicated to use but i loved it but there's only a few again with keyboards there's only a few that have appreciated you know yeah. like some of the old roland jupiters those are now worth way more than when they first were brought out. So there's a few things, but for the generally for the most part, and you can tell this with all sorts of camera equipment is sim similar. So audio gear is no different. Uh, resale value is important. Um, and you want to try and maintain, you know, 50%, something like that. So let's, let's, let's again go back to big picture. Yep. Somebody comes in, I've got a budget of $5,000. Yep. How would you help him allocate that budget? So what I would do right now is I would literally, if it was $5,000, a pair of speakers and uh, an all-in-one integrated app that does streaming. So it's much, 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 much simpler. Uh, cabling you can do later, but um, yeah, so you need two pieces. Like, and you can have a very good little system. You know, you start out with a pair of Sonettles, Sonettle Ones, I believe, or even a pair of the Focal Arias. Um, and then Blue Sound Power Note. That's a great little, you know, all in one. Or Hegel. And just or the Hegel, the if you want a slightly <coughs> more capability in terms of um, slightly better sound, uh, and, and you're done. If you have anything left over, invest in a good pair of speaker cables. And you could be very happy with that for a very long time. It's so much simpler now. If you want to add a turntable, there are there are some inexpensive choices out there. And turntables, generally speaking, haven't really... Uh, well, they've gotten very expensive, but the good basic stuff is still relatively inexpensive. And you can there's lots of good choices out there. And you always got, you always got way better performance out of a turntable than you would about... Most other things. Remember back in the day, if I had six hundred dollars to spend, I would buy a hundred dollar turntable, one sixth the budget. So everything else was applied to speakers and amp. Um, and the same can be said now. A good basic project turntable, uh, less than a thousand dollars, 
and that would be probably one of the ones with the with a phone stage built in. You could have also Bluetooth and stuff like that. So there's lots of ways of going about it, but basically, you know, you could buy Hegel H120 and a pair of LRSs, which a client of mine just recently did, and that's a fabulous combination. You you know, it'd be hard pressed to get much better than that. You have to spend at least double or triple that amount of money. Yeah. So I think that covers um, a, a, a pretty big, sorry, uh, yeah, a, a pretty big uh, a sense of what it is that um, you might want to look for. Um, just to recap, if possible, find a really good local dealer or two, find an audio mentor, um, read, but be careful not to uh, ascribe too much weight to all the different opinions because there's going to be a ton. Um, and and those opinions don't mean anything until you actually listen and can see if you agree with those opinions. Um, and then, yeah, uh, um, have, have a good sense of the budget and then just go out and have fun. If you can find a really good dealer who's willing to work with you, I, I think that'll help you tremendously. Any last words? Uh, just remember, you can't always hit a home run or, you know, it's not going to be perfect. The whole point of it is it is a journey. I tell people this all the time. And, of course, we're more than happy to help you along uh, at the start of the journey and throughout the journey. But it is a journey, and you're going to make, you know, you're going you're gonna to want to change a few things. Uh, nothing is really a mistake, but you will definitely like some things better than others. And um, that, that is, you know, you have to discover that. That's, that's, that's I would say, 50% of the fun. I agree. I, I loved my journeys, uh, um, uh, my journey. Uh, f- uh, just as Philip was pointing that out, I was thinking about all the different preamps I tried. I, w- I was on a kick, a uh, preamp kick for the longest time. So when uh, just recently we got in this uh, BAT VK, what's it called? 60 or 65? 51, 51. 51 SE. Oh my God. I heard that thing years ago. I loved it. It was wonderful. And and uh, so we just sold it. I, I uh, it sold in one day. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just as I was writing up the ad for it, I was looking to see if I could find quotes, and you know, uh, uh, brought me to Stereophile review, and and I can't remember the reviewer's name now. It's weird, but what he said in the review, almost word for word, I agreed because this is what I experienced when I heard the BAT. And back then, I was very seriously considering BAT. We, we, but we were in a bad position financially, so we couldn't do that and also do something else, which I had already agreed to. But I loved what I heard. Um, so that, that preamplifier, wow. Who, that, that so, you know, I'm it? still on a preamplifier kick. You, 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 you're constantly on different things. It's like, oh, but, you know, we, we, we talked about shindles, so... Yes. That's that's something that's on. Yeah, the, that's something that we, we you know we might just do a video just strictly on Shindo just to talk philosophically about this company. I'm I'm of two very very different minds about this company, which is kind of weird. Usually I have a strong opinion, but in this case I don't know. Anyway, uh, we better wrap up. Uh, Adrian from Audio Excellence Canada, Philip and Jerry. As usual, if you like the video, please subscribe, turn on notification, thumbs up, share with other people. And we'll see you again next time. And watch out for our next videos, uh, uh, the interview with uh, Garth Powell from AudioQuest. It, so that should come with... after these two, right? I because otherwise so. it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Who the hell cares? Anyway, see you next time. Bye-bye. All right, later.